prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you now and we ask you to uh, bless us. You've been looking after us, caring for us in so many ways. And we realize, Lord Jesus, that there's so many. When we look up, uh, at ourselves and our problems, and there's so many that are worse off than we are. And we're thankful that uh, we're in your capable hands. And it gives us great comfort to know that we are in your great uh, hands of love, that we are your sheep, and that you are our shepherd, and we have this wonderful biblical relationship that we certainly need to respect and honor and be thankful for. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, this morning uh, we are going to talk about the hireling. The hireling. I would have you turn in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 10 and verse 11. John chapter 10 and verse 11. Jesus said, quote, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catches, catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Very interesting what we're reading in these particular verses and what Jesus is giving us warning of. You know, there's a lot of warnings in the, in the, in the Bible that we are given. And we need to take heed, special notice of all of those warnings. And here there are some additional warnings on the hireling. And we discovered that, an, first of all, an hireling is obviously not a shepherd, not the good shepherd. And we discovered that the sheep do not belong to an hireling. Because of why? Well, when the uh, sh um, true shepherd sees the wolf coming, what does he do? Well, he gives warning. He warns. He helps prepare the sheep. Now, obviously, in addition to this, there's preparation that goes on before the, the quote, sheep discover who the wolf is. So there's additional information that the shepherd has to continue to, to feed the, sh the uh, sheep about the wolf, who the wolves are, what the wolves do. Well, what do wolves do, ladies and gentlemen? They eat sheep. So that's very, wouldn't you think that that would be pretty important to know if you're in the sheep category, and we all are. And so uh, we need to know who the various wolves are. How can we discover what a wolf is? So the shepherd will prepare the sheep ahead of time giving them biblical word, information, teachings on who the wolves are, and also the fact that they are the sheep, and what that means and what that entails. And so the, the, a true shepherd will take the sheep back to uh, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, and share with them their origin, where they came from, what the covenants and promises are and how they pertain to the sheep and build them up in the spiritual most holy faith. Abraham was uh, of the faith. What was that faith? How did that faith develop? 
so they will be given all this wonderful biblical instruction to strengthen them and prepare them so that uh, they will not be eaten by the wolves. What, what else can we uh, learn of the wolves? Well, the wolves come to do what? Part of their, their plan to eat the sheep is to scatter the sheep. Have we not been scattered? Have we not been divided in lots of different ways? Of course, on doctoral lines, we've been, we've been divided over that. Racially, have we not been divided? Are we not being divided today? I um, make mention of this every now and then, but it's still important and it still applies. And it applies even more so today with all the commercials. Look at all the uh, multicultural commercials that they have today and the subtle information that is put across on TV. Well, in the old westerns, if you'll go back and look at them, I mean, gun smoke, you name it, bonanza, it doesn't matter. All of them were indoctrinating people falsely. And they were using uh, cunning writers. Now, these, wool, these writers are wolves in sheep clothing. Well, I'll describe them that way to you. And they would put forth a scenario, let's say, of a settler who would be married to or would have taken a, quote, squaw as his wife. And then the white settlers would be mad about it. In town, they would be mad about it. And they would do everything they could to stop this. But throughout this quote, Western program, no scriptures would have been used. It would have just been hate and venom coming out of the uh, town's people, the men, white men of the town. And that the, uh, this white man who had taken a squaw is the poor innocent victim picked on. And then at the end, all the white men are made to feel bad and sent home because they were against this interracial relationship. Something along those lines. Fill in the blank. That was, those types of programs were frequently done back in the 50s and the 60s and even before that. And still in the 70s, even more so. Lots of brainwashing material, but I don't want to dwell on that, but I did want, I did want to make that point that um, there are wolves in sheep clothing and or there are, let's say, hireling that are doing a job and it's really kingdom work because these are kingdom parables. Let's understand what we're reading here. These are kingdom parables. So if your heart's not in it, then you don't really care about the truth of the gospel or the kingdom message, would you? You don't even really understand it. You're just a hireling, biblically speaking, with what the Word of God is teaching us on these things. So in verse 13, as an example, it talks about the hireling, and that the hireling careth not for the sheep. A hireling just wants his what? His wages. Thank you. A Harley just wants to get paid. He doesn't care really that much about the work. Some do and some don't. Okay? But we're going to get into that. And um, we'll start by looking in the uh, Strong's Bible Concordance. Harley is number 3411 as an example. Misthotos. That's the word. That's the Greek word. And it means a wage worker, good or bad. That's okay. So we're learning a little bit of, of something about the hireling here. 
Also, I, I looked up in a number of places, and it, uh, like the uh, complete word study reference on this uh, same Greek word, um, it's one who is not showing real interest in his duty and who is unfaithful. Hmm, gives a little bit more of a description here. And it also says someone who is an harling. It goes on to uh, tell us that it could even be a ruler or uh, a prince. Isn't that one of the main problems right there, I thought to myself, that we have rulers over us that are, act, that are nothing more than harlings. They're, and they're out for the money. Politicians, as an example, right? They've been ruled, kings, the kings over Israel, have they been good kings or mostly bad kings? Bad kings, yes. But at times you ask people, and even you would ask uh, some people, let's say even in England, uh, are, are, is the queen a good queen or is she a bad queen? Or in the past, have you had good kings or bad kings? Are they good kings over you? Do they love you? Do they care for you? Well, actually, for the most part, looking at the evidences that we uh, are shown from looking back on the way that they ruled over their people, they did not really love or care. They were not true shepherds. Now, in Christ's day, they had another category. And this kind of brings it more home to what these scripture verses are talking about. Uh, leaders of, or of, of over Israel at that time, Sadducees and Pharisees. So you had the political and the religious leaders at that time, Sadducees and Pharisees. Bible does not speak very highly of the Sadducees or, or Pharisees, right? Did, were they really caring for the, quote, sheep? Now look at the way that they acted. Look at the things that they... They were all constantly trying to trip up Christ, who is the true shepherd. They were constantly arguing against him, setting him up, and speaking out, um, just devising ways to, um, to bring him down, to destroy him. Even to pick up, the Bible says, like we went over last week, stones to stone our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They hated him. Wow, they hated him. So what might you do if you are, let's say, a, a Sadducee or a Pharisee, and you hate the Lord Jesus Christ? What might you do? Well, there's no stopping them, really. The, anything is a fair game in their mind as ways to destroy him, to bring him down, to hurt him, destroy his ministry, and cause the people to lose their faith in him, to hate him. The list goes on and on. It, it's a sad commentary, a sad reality of the way things were. Well, look at things today. Is it really any different when we are looking at the rulers? Can you say that our rulers love Christ? Our political rulers? You know, they had the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Look what we got today. We got Republicans and Democrats. Do they love Jesus? Even though some of them will say that they love Jesus and they'll carry their Bible around, they'll quote scripture verses to you. I don't know about you, but I even worry more when they'll quote scripture verses to me today. I will say, I will think more, uh, more in the line of what, what are they, 
doing here? Were they telling me the truth or were they lying to me? They're politicians. And, they, and I listen to the way that they act. I look, I look at the way that they vote. You know, we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. Isn't that what the Bible says? And by golly, we better do it, Israel. That's important to know. I don't care who you're talking to. So, by their fruit you shall know them. So, don't we really know? Do we really have to be told what these politicians are all about today? Where they're coming from? What their goal and objective is? Are they bringing us closer to Christ and His kingdom and His word? Well, no. You, you know, Pastor, you know, you got to be realistic. We can't just, we can't be go teaching God's word. We can't be go supporting God's word because it just isn't practical today. That isn't the type of government we have. Well, you know, you know, uh, it's kind of like what they say, Pastor. There's separation of church and state, which isn't even in the Constitution. They say it's a, a, a letter that was passed on by Jefferson. And, well, you know, there's all kinds of excuses, folks, for going the wrong way. Jesus told us, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That ought to be a big hint right there. Are they following Christ? Are they following His Word? He's the Word. Are they following the Word? Are they teaching the Word? Are they prescribing God's Word as, bib as a biblical solution? How many are doing that today as politicians? Well, they, they've touched on it. You know, they have good hearts. They have good meanings. I wonder, though, I mean, really analyze, do they really have your best interest in mind if they're not going to really prescribe biblical solutions and teach the Word or, or quote the Word or use the Word as examples for all the various positions that they have that they're going to take. I'll believe that they're for the Word. I believe that they love the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friends, when they do away with the United Nations as one example. That's just a good start. When they do away with all the foreign aid, all these foreign nations out there, that all of them pretty much are antichrists anyway. Is there one nation really that we have to be supporting that's an Israelite white nation? Really, do they need our support? I mean, Israel, giving them billions and billions as, as an example in, in uh, foreign aid? Well, if they're God's chosen people, as the Judeos Christians tell us they are, they ought to be, as I've said before, sending us billions and billions of dollars in foreign aid. When, when you look at the wars, and what are all these foreign wars all about? Should we be involved in these foreign entanglements? Should we be involved in the affairs of these antichrist countries and regimes? We can't even straighten up our own nation. What if we put all these billions of dollars that are in foreign aid and wars and put that money to work in our nation just on... There's a lots of ways that we could be using it for good reasons. But, I mean, heck, with all that money, we, we could buy everybody pretty much that's uh, uh, hurting financially. We could buy them a house. We could, we, 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 there's so many things that we could be doing with that money in a good way to help really the really needful or needy people in our own nation, as an example, which everybody likes to talk about, the needy. We can build the wall. How's that sound? No problem. No problem building a wall. We could build highway systems that would be second to none. Railway systems would be second to none. Thank you. I've, my wife brought me a drink up here. 
So I was, I'll take a drink, thank you. But getting back on the subject here is what are, are the goals and objectives that a hireling should have? What are the goals and objectives that a true shepherd should have? Well, they all ought to be biblically based. They ought to, they, our focus ought to be on getting back to the Word. If whoever it is, a religious leader, I mean, is the Pope, as an example, one of the Catholics, uh, the, the highest office of the Catholic Church? Is he following the Word of God? Is he really following Bible principles? Or is he a one-world liar and deceiver? He's a one-world liar and deceiver. He's not really following and teaching and directing the people according to what the Word of God says. Because if you're following the Word, it'll have the right results. If our politicians were really teaching and following the, what the Word of God prescribes, God would be blessing our nation and we would be, not be involved in these foreign entanglements. We wouldn't be making secret deals and we wouldn't have, the high, ta we wouldn't have high taxes. We'd have biblical taxes, a biblical tithe. We would be doing things according to what the kingdom of God prescribes. We would be looking at Bible principles and implementing Bible principles in what we're doing. And it does, this doesn't apply just to the Pope. It applies to the bishops. It applies to the cardinals. It applies, it applies to the quote, those who call themselves priests. They are not true shepherds. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this for some people. It would be offend, uh, offensive to some, possibly. But if all you're getting out, all you're doing in your gospel is just, I want to get them saved. I want them to say the name of Jesus. I want to come down the aisle and get saved. And that's all you're teaching. You are not teaching the true word. And if you're not teaching the true word, then what are you doing? You're leading the sheep in the wrong direction. And that's putting it mildly. The sheep need to be fed the Word of God regularly. What did the, um, what was required in the Bible of the kings? Just, we'll, we'll talk about the kings, the leaders of Israel. They were supposed to read God's Word yearly to them. They were supposed to make known the laws, the statutes, and the judgments of God Almighty to the sheep. That's what ought to be done. True shepherds ought to be teaching, therefore, the word to Israel. Get them to understand what the law says. That we may live righteously within our home within our community, within our state, within our nation. I mean, it from the ground up, we could say. Some people have the opinion that, well, from the ground up, that's how we grow. And that is one way that we grow. But I want to tell you that I think possibly that's somewhat misinformed or not totally correct. Because what if we had it the other way, where the kings and the leaders, from the president to Congress to, you know, you name it, even the religious leaders were doing it, and it went from the top down. What a big difference and quick difference that would make. I think they want us to think that, you know, which again, we're supposed to do, the heads of the family and the family, you know, y'all. that's where... It, it, that's where we're going to get the 
the biggest bang for our buck religiously. And yeah, certainly that should happen. But I believe it ought to be coming from the top down. And I think we missed it in many ways because of that. Which means that, folks, we got to do everything that we can then, when you think, to get rid of these false shepherds, these false leaders, these despots. Well, I don't know if I'd call them despots. These princes over Israel, these rulers. I mean, isn't there w wickedness in high places of our government? Isn't that what the Word of God warns us about? Yes. Romans 13. Hmm. Well, if there is a Romans 13, the way that the Judeo-Christians teach and prescribe it, which I'm not for, and I don't agree with that, but, you know, it's get, then that should put strong emphasis upon Christians getting righteous leaders there, running for office themselves. I mean, if, if a lot of these uh, people who call themselves Christians really believe that and they're running for office and doing that, it would make a difference. How many of them, though, when they get in office, it doesn't take them long before they themselves become corrupt? They're not following God's Word. They're more interested in learning the structure and the laws and the ways of Babylon, may I say, than learning and applying what God's Word says and doing what the Word says. Well, that would confuse the people, they would say. Uh, the, the, that would turn them, the system, against me. They'll kick me off committees. Uh... Things won't go well for me if I do that. Well, you do have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. But for every law that they put that comes across your desk that they want you to vote on, all the different regulations, you name it, all the policies that come across your desk, what if you looked at them, you, and you said to yourself, what does the word God say, word of God say on this policy or this regulation or this law? Excuse me, let me get my microphone back on. What, if, what does the word of God say about it? How am I supposed to look at this biblically? How should I apply this? What righteous decisions what does God require of me in this situation? And what if they did that? That would make a really good difference. Now let me say, there's nothing wrong with being a hireling in the basic sense of that word. You know, you, you're a wage earner. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Especially if you have the right work, work ethic if you are just, if you are honest, if you do your job, if you're a hireling and you are faithful to your boss for what he's hired you for. I want you to think about this parable from Matthew chapter 20. Let's go there real quick. Matthew 20 and we'll start reading in verse 1. This is another kingdom parable. Quote, Again, this is Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. He went out to hire laborers. Nothing wrong with that. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle 
in the marketplace. So he thought, this isn't good. They need to be put to work. So he's going to make them productive for what? To be doers of the word, right? He wants to make them productive doers of the word. And he went out again about third hour of the way doing this in the marketplace. And it, verse four, and he said unto them, go ye also unto the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? And they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. Interesting. And he said unto them, Go ye also unto the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Now, somebody would apply this to the salvation gospel. And I have no problem with, as long as we're talking about the biblical form and explanation of salvation, Jesus is our Redeemer. We do receive great re re rewards from this, do we not? He, though, the Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus, is our reward. He's our, quote, doesn't sound like much when you look at it in today's terms, a penny, but back then it was a denaros, if I understand the Greek term for penny properly. That was the wage. That was what they earned. Whether you worked um, 11 hours or 12 hours, whatever you worked that day, that's what you received. We'll but this is a parable of what and hireling was to get paid. What's of value to you? Are there eternal values in the Word of God? You bet there are. Does that value per, per se change? No, it's the same, really, the same reward you're going to receive whether if you became a Christian when you were, let's say, use the example of six years old or 99 years old. There is this understanding about the reward and what we are to receive. There are many special rewards that we will see throughout our lifetime. Let's say if you become a faithful doer of the word from your six, six years old on, right? There are many special rewards. Who's the rewarder though? Christ. He's our rewarder. He's what we are to receive unto ourselves. Well, Pastor, I'm not so sure we receive Christ. Well, are those of our own race, of our Israelite seed, do they not need the Lord Jesus Christ in their life? And are they not wandering around out there, many of them today, lost? Even at the time of Christ, they were lost. They were in need of hearing the word and receiving the word. Again, he is our reward. I want to get that point made right now. Now, we could develop that more, but I want to make that main point right now. And there are many special blessings we can receive in that he is our rewarder. 
But let's go on to verse 8. And when even was come, or evening time was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. I mean, right there, that just almost sounds the opposite. It ought to be those who came in first, make sure to reward them, and then those who came in last, reward them. In, our, in, your, in your carnal mind, in your carnal thinking, and your human reasoning, doesn't that sound more fair, more just? And when they came, they were hired about the eleventh hour, and they received every man a penny. Again, this is a uh, denarius. Uh, this is the Greek word for the type of payment that they receive for a day's labor. And when the first came, they supposed that they, that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour. And again, and they received the same payment? And thou hast made them equal with us which have bo borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way, and I will give unto this last, even as I unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Now, we are a sheep, the sheep of his pasture. Isn't Christ, doesn't he have the freedom to do with us as he will? Is he being unjust in what he's giving us, dear friends? It is not lawful for me to do, is it not lawful for me lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. When you say this is talking about the hireling, what can again we say about the harling? Well, they are, according to the definition, wage earners. Workers, also we could say, according to what these verses are telling us, in the vineyard. And what might that be? Well, let's say the kingdom of God, because it's the good shepherd calling his sheep laborers. And, of course, there are those that come first. And there are those that are talked about in these verses here that come last. You know, I couldn't help but think about the thief on the cross when I read this. Did he not come last in that example? He's up on the cross, and he asked the Lord Jesus Christ, Please remember me in paradise, or when you come into paradise, or however you, uh, there are some disputes on what was that exactly said. We won't go over that right now. But he's, and Jesus said to him, I will remember you when I come into paradise. Right? Now, this is, I mean, you talk about the 11th hour and minute 59 out of 12 hour period. You talk about that, that's where that thief is. He hasn't done really much good. Think about it. What merits can this guy cling to or hold to 
He's on the cross. He's a thief, the Bible tells us. Um, he might have been, I'm sure he's guilty of many other things, but the Bible calls him a thief. And at that late hour, Christ says, you're welcome. You're going to be welcome into my kingdom. Now, I don't want to get into, you know, he's going to be ruling and reigning with Christ and all that. That's not what Christ says. He says, you, you'll be a part of my kingdom. I'm going to bring you into my kingdom. Well, there's a strong sense of me that I love that type of a message that shows the love of Christ. It shows that he is truly a forgiving Christ. And it shows that there's hope for any of you out there who are listening to me right now that you may have done a number of things wrong. You may think that your life is a failure. Well, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, isn't that right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Some of you have been working at it for 40, 50, 60, or more years. And you may think of yourselves, well, look at me. Look how great I am. Look at the rewards that I should receive because I've been involved in the kingdom work for all these many years. Well, I'm glad that you are. And aren't you glad that you are? Do you feel like you have not been rewarded for working in Christ's kingdom? Oh my God. Let's get our spiritual heads together here, folks. Let's get on the right biblical track in our way of thinking that we should be happy for them. Look at all the, let's say, the Apostle Paul had to endure. All the apostles had to endure persecution. But when we look at the apostle, I mean, there were beatings, imprisonments, imprisonments, all kinds of shipwrecks, all kinds of struggles and hardships that he had to go through. Do you think that he was blessed, though? Was God not blessing him and looking after him, providing for him all through that struggle that he had to go through when he was involved in the kingdom work? He was doing what God called him to do. I can't I can't think of what I'd rather be doing than what I'm doing right now. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 um, folks, whatever, you have a calling out there, and you need to pray about that calling. If you think for one minute that it's supposed to be, well, I need to uh, have a church and a congregation, and I need to be preaching the word, and that's, all, that's what I'm supposed to do, and that's what the kingdom work is all about. You need your eyes open. You need your vision expanded. And you need to pray. You really need to pray about that to say, really, is, is, Lord, is there some particular work, some calling that you called me into that I can be doing, busy about being busy about the Heavenly Father's business, the kingdom work? And I believe there is. Do you not? You know, back before I was in the ministry, I was a Christian, and there are many things I lacked in my understanding, but God always provided me things to do in the kingdom, to go helping, to be ministered, to get people out of deception. Uh, when... Uh, Kingdom ministers that I learned about needed help. I was always there helping them. Doing lots of different things. Uh, I wasn't rich, but I was doing whatever this poor boy could do at the time. And there wasn't, a one, there wasn't one time, as an example, when I uh, moved to Phoenix and got to know Pastor Remy, and I attended Pastor Remy's work, when he asked for something or suggested some need in the ministry, pa Dave, I wasn't a pastor again. Dave Barley wasn't right there saying, what can I do, Pastor, to help? When, when they, he had his first conference, and I'm not saying this to brag. Don't think of this as a fleshly thing. I'm just using it as an example. When uh, 
he, want, he wanted to, uh, the idea came to him to have a conference, a kingdom conference back in 76. And we were going to have it up in the mountains in Payson, Arizona at the time. And so I thought, wow, Lord, I really did. I said, Lord, what can I do to be of help? And so I got together with one other uh, young man in the church, and I talked to him, and I said, would, would you help me and let's be a, be a part of this? And what? let's help Pastor Ermey. I, I told him, I said, I was thinking of, one thing, having a treasure hunt to get young people involved. So I set, we, he and I set up a treasure hunt, and we spent weeks developing ideas and little sayings like um, there was a bridge there and it went over this little creek. And so I thought, well, we can uh, put a, a clue there call, and we'll call it like Bridge Over Troubled Water. And they find it and, that, and then when they read that clue and they, it leads them to another area. And on and on. And there's about a dozen different places and we had about three of them and three groups going in different directions. And they all led to the treasure, which was in this certain pavilion, uh, locked be in a locked door, stuffed with ice cold watermelon that we bought. I didn't ask Pastor Ream for it, money up for it. We bought and put them in there ahead of time. And the winner got to eat first. They, their group liked to, got to line up and eat the watermelon first. And then everybody asked, and we had a great time doing that. And um, um, there were probably three of the things that I thought of, not just doing that, but things that I told Pastor Ermey, would you mind if we helped you out and took this off your shoulders and we did this for you during this conference? And he was so thankful, so happy that we did that at uh, the conference. And you may think, well, that's, you know, let me tell you, that was a pretty big thing for us back then. And, and it excited us, and it just gave us more ideas for opportunities that the Lord Jesus presented itself to. And, and you know, you have to step out in faith. You may think, well, it didn't take a whole lot of faith. Well, it 